So hi everybody, this is Susan here again. We may have met before. I work as a volunteer at St. Bridget's Home here in Quebec City, and I've been reading to seniors for the last four years. As you may know, Quebec City is about 96, 98% French speaking. And I chose to read in English, even though I, I speak French quite well now that I've lived here for 45 years, because I thought that Anglophone seniors, although they're bilingual too, I found out, might appreciate hearing stories read in their mother tongue. And that's really been the, been the case. So today we'll be together for about half an hour. I hope you enjoy the pieces that I've chosen. When I was looking for a theme for today's reading, I was sitting in my room with the window open, listening to the birds, and I thought, hmm, that might be fun. Try to find stories and poems related to birds. So here we go. This is quite a menagerie. <laughs> so for the first reading, I want to read a poem uh, called The Writer by Richard Wilbur. It's a poem written by an American poet uh, born in 1921. His poems are included in this book, A Hundred Great Poets of the English Language. So I think we're in pretty good hands. In this poem, Wilbur describes a scene where he hears his daughter writing a story on a typewriter, clickety-clack, in the old days when we had typewriters, clickety-clack. At the same time, he's reminded of a starling that got caught in his house. Now, I don't know whether you know much about starlings. Apparently, they travel in flocks of thousands and pose incredible hazards to air travel, just an aside. So here we go. The writer. In her room at the prow of the house where light breaks and the windows are tossed with linden, my daughter is writing a story. I pause in the stairwell, hearing from her shut door a commotion of typewriter keys, like a chain hauled over a gunwale. Young as she is, the stuff of her life is a great cargo and some of it heavy. I wish her a lucky passage. But now it is she who pauses, as if to reject my thought and its easy figure. A stillness greatens in which the whole house seems to be thinking. And then she's at it again with a bunched clamor of strokes and again is silent. I remember the day's starling, which was trapped in that very room two years ago. How we stole in, lifted a sash and retreated, not to affright it. And how the helpless hour, through the crack of the door, we watched the sleek, wild, dark and iridescent creature batter against the brilliance, drop like a glove to the hard floor or the desktop. And wait then, humped and bloody, for the wits to try it again. You may have seen those bird, the birds that do that. If they hit a window, you'll think they're dead, and they get up and they hit it again. And how our spirits rose when, suddenly sure, it lifted off from a chair back, beating a smooth course for the right window and clearing the sill of the world. It is always a matter, my darling, of life and death, as I had forgotten. I wish what I wished you before, but harder. The second uh, story, this is a story I want to read. It's called The Canary by Catherine Mansfield. Now this was the story that got me thinking about, really about reading about birds. It's quite, it's quite an amazing story, <laughs> you'll hear. Um, Catherine Mansfield was born in New Zealand and at the end of the 19th century and lived most of her life in London. She's known for writing about interior dialogues that we have, stories that go on in our mind and in our heart. It's about a, a woman's love for her pet bird, a canary. Funny, she, does, she never gives it a name, you'll notice in the story. She just calls it, my darling, my darling canary. And a little aside on canaries, um, they're loved mostly for their songs and have been bred since the late 1500s. Imagine, mostly in England. So people would go and get uh, these canaries from, guess where, the Canary Islands, which are islands off Morocco. Today, there are more than 200 breeds of canaries. So here we go. 
the canary. This one story is a bit long, so uh, you'll have to be patient, but I think, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. You see that big nail to the right of the front door? I, I can scarcely look at it now, and yet I could not bear to take it out. I should like to think it was there always, even after my time. I sometimes hear the next people saying, there must have been a cage hanging from there, and it comforts me. I feel he's not quite forgotten. You cannot imagine how wonderfully he sang. It was not like the singing of other canaries, and that isn't just my fancy. Often from the window, I used to see people stop at the gate to listen, or they would lean over the fence by the mock orange for quite a long time, carried away. I suppose it sounds absurd to you. It wouldn't if you heard him, but it really seemed to me that he sang whole songs with a beginning and an end to them. For instance, when I finished the house in the afternoon and changed my blouse and brought my sewing onto the veranda here, he used to hop, hop, hop from one perch to another, tap against the bars as if to attract my attention, sip a little water just as a professional singer might, and then break into a song so exquisite that I had to put my needle down to listen to him. I can't describe it. I wish I could. But it was always the same every afternoon, and I felt that I understood every note of it. Jeez, this is quite a story, huh? This love for this canary. I've never heard of anyone loving a canary so much. I loved him. Oh, how I loved him. This is a good, this is a, an important line in the story. Perhaps it does not matter so very much what it is one loves in this world, but love something one must. Isn't that true? Huh? Love something one must. Of course, there was always my little house in the garden, but for some reason they were never enough. Flowers respond wonderfully, but they don't sympathize. <laughs> then I loved the evening star. Does that sound foolish? It does a bit, doesn't it? Sounds foolish, loving an evening star. I used to go into the backyard after sunset and wait for it until it shone after the dark gum tree. I used to whisper, there you are, my darling. And just in that first moment, it seemed to be shining for me alone. It seemed to understand this, something which is like longing, and yet it's not longing, or regret. It's more like regret. And yet regret for what? I have so much to be thankful for. But after he came into my life, I forgot the evening star. I did not need it anymore, but it was strange. When the man who came to the door with birds to sell held, held him up in his tiny cage, and instead of fluttering, fluttering like the poor little goldfinches, he gave a faint little chirp. I found myself saying, just as I had said to the star over the gum tree, oh, there you are, my little darling. From that moment, he was mine. It surprises me even now to remember how he and I shared each other's lives. Isn't it amazing <laughs> sharing your life with a canary? The moment I came down in the morning and took the cloth off his cage, he greeted me with a drowsy little note. I knew it meant, Missus, Missus. Then I hung him on the nail outside while I got my three young men their breakfast, and I never brought him in until we had the house to ourselves again. Then, when the washing up was done, it was quite a little entertainment. I spread a newspaper over a corner of the table, and when I put the cage on it, he used to beat with his wings despairingly, as if he didn't know what was coming. You're a regular little actor, I used to scold him. I scraped the tray, dusted it with fresh sand, filled his seed and water tins, tucked a piece of cheap chickweed and half a chili between the bars. And I am perfectly certain he understood and appreciated every item of this little performance. You see, by nature, he was exquisitively neat. There was never a speck on his perch. And you'd only to see him enjoy his bath to realize he had a real small passion for cleanliness. His bath was put in last. And the moment it was, it was in, whoops, at the moment it was in his it was in, he positively leapt into it. 
sorry about that. <laughs> At the moment it was in, he positively ducked. First he fluttered one wing, then the other, then he ducked his head and dabbled his breast feathers. Drops of water were scattered all over the kitchen, but still he would not get out. I used to say to him, now that's quite enough. You're only showing off. And at last out he hopped and standing on one leg, he began to peck himself dry. Finally, he gave a shake, a flick, a twitter, and he lifted his throat. Oh, I can hardly bear to recall it. I was always cleaning knives at the time. And it almost seemed to me the knives sang too as I rubbed them bright on the board. Company, you see, that was what it was. Perfect company. If you have lived alone, you will realize how precious that is. Of course, there were my three young men who came into supper every evening, and sometimes they stayed in the dining room afterwards reading the paper. They, were, they would have been boarders. Huh? But I could not expect them to be interested in the little things that made my day. Why should they be? I was nothing to them. In fact, I over overheard them one evening talking about me on the stairs as the scarecrow. Mm, that's good. No matter. It doesn't matter. Not in the least. I quite understand. They're young. And why should I mind? But I remember feeling so especially thankful that I was not quite alone that evening. I told him after they'd gone out. I said, do you know what they call Mrs? And he put his head on one side and looked at me with his little bright eye until I could not help laughing. It seemed to amuse him. Have you kept birds? If you haven't all, if you haven't, all this must sound perhaps exaggerated. It does sound a bit exaggerated, doesn't it? But people have the idea that birds are heartless, cold little creatures, not like dogs and cats. My washerwoman used to say on Mondays when she wandered, wondered why I didn't keep a nice fox terrier. There's no comfort, miss, in canaries. Untrue, dreadfully untrue. <laughs> I remember one night, I had had an awful dream. Dream can be dread, dreams can be dreadfully cruel. Even after I had woken up, I couldn't get over it. So I put my dressing, ga dressing gown and went down to the kitchen for a glass of water. It was a winter night and raining hard. I suppose I was still half asleep. But through the kitchen window that hadn't a blind, it seemed to me the dark was staring in, spying. And suddenly I felt it was unbearable that I had no one to whom I could say, oh, I've had a terrible dream, or hide me from the dark. I even covered my face for a minute. And then there came a little, sweet, sweet. His cage was on the table, and the cloth had slipped so that a chink of light shone through. Sweet, sweet said the darling little fellow again, softly, as much to say, I'm here, missus, I'm here. That was so beautifully comforting that I nearly cried. And now he's gone. I should never have another bird, another pet of any kind. How could I? When I found him lying on his back with his eyes dim and his claws wrung, when I realized that never again should I hear my darling sing, Something seemed to die in me. My heart felt hollow as if it was his cage. I shall get over it, of course. I must. One can, can get over anything in time. And people always say I have a cheerful disposition. And they're quite right. I thank my God I have. All the same, without being morbid and giving way to memories and so on, I must confess that there does seem... To me, something sad in life. It's hard to say what it is. I don't mean the sorrow that, that we all know, like illness and poverty and death. No, it's, it's something different. It is there, deep down, deep down, part of one, just like one's breathing. However hard I work and tire myself, I have only to stop to know it's there, waiting. I often wonder if everyone feels the same. One can never know. But isn't it extraordinary that under his sweet, joyful singing, it was just this, this sadness. And what is it that I heard?
So for the third reading, I'm going to read a story called A Real Bargain by Mary Connors. It's from a book of short stories designed to be read aloud to. Um, this story is quite a bit lighter than what I just read about the canary and the woman who loved the canary. It's about uh, humming, hummingbirds this time, um, but it's mostly about a woman who gets this great deal on a hummingbird feeder, but ends up spending a lot more time and energy on getting the bird feeder working. And it talks about her relationship with her husband. Uh, as you probably know, hummingbirds are the smallest birds alive. Uh, I, I saw one the other day, and what often happens is we hear them before we see them because their wings uh, flap, flap so quickly that it's like a, a sound that you hear. They can, um, and they can flap their wings up to 80 beats a second. Isn't that amazing? And their heart beats 20 times a second. So that's pretty fast. <laughs> so I love hummingbirds. Anyway, here it, here it is, a real bargain. The small red plastic hummingbird feeder tossed on the 25 cent table caught my eye. Tulips, robins, and yard sales, sure signs of spring, were everywhere. This was my first yard sale of the year. It felt good to have winter done with. I swiftly paid for the feeder, my bargain of the day. I will commune with nature in peace and harmony at yard sale prices, I thought. Hmm. When I proudly presented my treasure to Jack, my practical husband, he began asking annoying questions. Where is the best place to hang it? And when do you hang it? And what kind of food do you put in it? A bargain isn't a bargain if you don't use it. I'm not going to hang the feeder until I can get it just right, he said. Okay. Not wishing to display my ignorance, a $5.99 book detailing hummingbird habits seemed like a logical investment. That would protect my 25 cent investment. You see where this story is going up? Huh? The feeder should be hung high near flowers in a clearly visible location sometime early in April, the book read. Armed with this knowledge, Jack surveyed our property for the best site. For several weeks, Jack looked. Every morning, I would put the feeder next to his coffee cup, and finally, he could ignore me no longer. The corner of the balcony is both high and clearly visible, he said. But, bargain hunter, there are no flowers nearby. <laughs> A six-dollar investment in petunias and fertilizer solved that problem. Then a 15 half-barrel planter and five bucks for planting the soil. Now I had furnished the necessary flower bed and another week had gone by. To hang the feeder, I need an eight foot length of one inch conduit, Jack said. This cost only $6.99. <laughs> After he finally got started, it really didn't take him long to bend the conduit, fashion an arm on it, drill the hole, attach the hook, and then fasten the apparatus to the eaves of the balcony with non-corrosive metal straps. The cost of the straps? Ah, a mere neat $3.95. I consider the two weeks of Jack's spare time and the nagging from me, well, that was free. <laughs> Hummingbird feed, hummingbirds feed on sugar, water, and nectar, the book told me. Sugar, in the height of canning season, costs a paltry two bucks for a five pound bag. The nectar could be purchased at $1.89 for two ounces. With just this one more small investment, the hummers would, will be fed and I will be able to watch them while I have my morning coffee. By the middle of July, only three months later, my bargain was ready. <laughs> three months. It took them three months to get this thing on the road. The darling little creatures were eagerly anticipated. Will they forgive the delay? Will sugar, water, and nectar be appetizing enough? Or should Kool-Aid be used to lure them? Remember Kool-Aid? Hmm. Do they prefer petunias or geraniums? They love red, as you probably know. I nervously wondered. The vision of graciously sipping my morning coffee while basking in nature's tranquility was so close. Within minutes of the first sugar offering, Ivan the Terrible established his territorial rights. 
This one inch red throated male hummingbird was an absolute tyrant. The fascists decided he was the owner and boss of the feeder. I named him after the meanest dictator I could think of. <laughs> Ivan maintained a perch on the, coast, on the clothesline. From there, he could guard his feeder when his voracious appetite was appeased. His vigilant perch could be an example for all the militia. <laughs> his watchful head swiveled back and forth, anticipating intruders. He protected his treasure. An audacious hummingbird poaching Ivan's private stock was subject to immediate dive bombing. Our balcony became a battleground. Zoom! Ivan swept down on the trespassers, missing my head by inches. With the precision of a fighter pilot, he descended upon his prey, and in the process of dodging the little warrior, I soaked my morning paper with spilled coffee. The pugnacious battler drove off groups of two and three invaders of his oasis with fierce determination. Squeaking and chattering, he would attack bumblebees and wasps. Indeed, if a bald eagle had ventured towards the balcony, Ivan probably would have taken him on. It's like little dogs who want to attack big dogs. By mid-September, I noticed that Ivan was working overtime. Migration season the book said. Instinct had brought an evasion of hummingbird travelers heading south for the winter. It's amazing, these little tiny birds, they go miles and miles uh, every year. Our feeder was just a rest stop on their long journey. Soon Ivan will give up his kingdom, join their ranks, and be just another transient, I mused. Hmm. You have fussed so much about that little varmint, I figured you'd be glad to get rid of him, Jack said. Well, how dull my morning coffee will be when the little tyrant is gone, I mourn. Hmm. The same hummingbirds will return to the same area every spring, the book consoled. And although the 25 cent feeder's final cost was more than $50, did I get a bargain? <laughs> And final reading today is another short story called Fine China and Feathered Friends by Charlotte Babcock. It's a funny story about a wife's clever revenge. This time we have two birds. The first one is a canary, one second, a canary again, and the second is a parakeet. As you probably know, but I had to look up, a parakeet is part of the parrot family and is the most vocal family, a bird in the family. They're able to mimic sounds they often hear, as you will see in this story. So, <clears throat> Aunt M was especially proud of her dining room. It was without question the brightest room in her small house. Large double windows on two adjoining walls allowed sunlight to reflect off the fancy dishes displayed on plate rails along the inner walls. The reflect, reflected light made shimmery images as it danced across her highly polished Queen Anne dining set. Pampered house plants on shelves beneath the windows provided a year round balance of greenery and wonderful blossoms. Aunt Anne had a way with plants and with birds too, as Uncle Ted discovered. So, Uncle Ted liked peace and quiet, particularly at mealtime. Live and let live, he'd say when Aunt Em would remark about the behavior of certain relatives. If it doesn't hurt us, it's not our concern. He was patient with children, and he thought animals should run free. Live and let live doesn't mean tying them up or putting them in a cage, he'd explain to any youngster who wanted to keep a found turtle or a baby bird. Wild animals are meant to be free. It's important in this, in this story that he thinks that wild animals should be free. His patience, however, was put to a double test when Aunt M, who had wanted a bird for years, brought home a canary, put it in the dining room, and declared firmly that it was there to stay. Mm -hmm. The bird cage hung on a stand between the windows. The canary, an expensive and wonderful singer, 
would puff out its throat and fill the whole house with song whenever household noises, the hum of the vacuum cleaner or the rattling of dishes, inspired it to sing. <laughs> the greater the commotion, the louder the canary sang. At mealtime, its song was so loud, was loud enough to interfere with normal conversation. Hmm. And that is what led to the bird's undoing. Uncle Ted did not appreciate a caged and noisy bird disrupting his, mere, his meals. But after 50 years with Aunt Em, he knew better than to complain. So for most of the spring, he suffered quietly through this mealtime disturbance. He did, however, devise a, a technique to shut the bird up. Whenever the canary would burst forth, Uncle Ted would suddenly wave his arms in the air. The motion would startle the canary into a few moments of silence. At the start of the next song, Uncle Ted would wave again, and so it would go until Uncle Ted left the table. So it wasn't much fun for him. To, he wasn't eating very much. He was mostly waving, I guess. Uncle Ted suffered suffering changed form on Father's Day. Aunt Em had invited the whole family and was busy cleaning and baking for days ahead. She added leaves to the table and set out her best china and silver. She was so busy that she didn't miss the canary until one of the children asked about it. Hmm, puzzled, Aunt Em stared at the empty cage for an instant. Then she shot a murderous look at Uncle Ted, who shrugged but said nothing. A few days later, after a neighbor reported seeing a bright yellow bird in her lilac bush, Aunt Em stopped speaking to Uncle Ted. <laughs> so, Aunt Em stubbornly left the empty cage in the dining room and took to eating alone in the kitchen, while Uncle Ted found excuses to eat in town. So this is quite a fight. A si they, they fight silently, as you can see. <laughs> Whenever anyone asked about the situation, Uncle Ted would politely change the subject. Aunt Em refused to comment at all. So in mid-July, there was another family occasion for Aunt Em to celebrate, and she made her usual preparations. When she went to set the table, Aunt Em found a blue parakeet preening its feathers in the canary cage. Hmm. Attached to the cage was a tag on which the question, truce, with a question mark, was scrawled. Unlike the care of the canary, the parakeet found no inspiration in mealtime sounds, and it went unnoticed by the others until it happened to squawk as dessert was being served. Aunt Em explained the bird's presence with terse honesty. I've been wanting a bird since Father's Day. Now I have one. She placed a piece of raspberry pie on a plate and it extended it across the table to Uncle Ted. Your favorite, she said sweetly. <laughs> I guess the truth worked. Uncle Ted showed visible relief as he gratefully nodded his thanks. Soon, Em and Ted were eating together again in the dining room. <laughs> Remember, we talk, we're going to talk about revenge, so wait until the end. By fall, it appeared that everyone had forgotten all about the canary. The parakeet would squawk occasionally at mealtimes, but Uncle Ted didn't seem to mind. He was, in fact, pleased that every morning Em would take the bird out of its cage to ride on her shoulder as she went about her housework. She talked to it and fed it treats while Uncle Ted privately congratulated himself for having made peace. But all this time, Aunt Em was working on revenge. It came about on Thanksgiving. The family was seated, heads bowed, waiting for Uncle Ted to say grace, when a voice from the birdcage unmistakably intoned, bad boy, bad boy, Ted. I don't know whether I sound like a parakeet, but it, sounds, it seems to me it sounds like that. Two of the younger grandchildren began to giggle, and Aunt Em quickly shushed them with a stern look. She tried to pretend she hadn't heard the parakeet, but the smug expression on her face gave her away. All the while they'd been doing the housework together, Em had been teaching the bird to talk. Remember I said at the beginning of the story that parakeets are really good at imitating. Now she was quite pleased with the results. Bad boy, <laughs> the, bird, the bird repeated again. This time adult snickering joined the children's. 
and Anne smiled. Then she put her fingers to her lips. Shh, 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 she said, it's time for Grace. Uncle Ted, head still bowed, knew all eyes were on him, and he blushed brightly before he began to pray. Thank you for all that's before us, Lord, he said reverently. Then, <laughs> raising his head, he looked straight at Aunt Em and softly added, especially those who can teach birds to talk. <laughs> Isn't that a funny story? <laughs> So this is the end of our reading for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the stories as much as I, I do reading them. Um, so we talked about birds and we talked about humans, but I guess the, the stories and the poem are really mostly about people, aren't they? And their relationship with each other. The first, the, remember the poem about the father and his daughter with an incident with a starling that, threw, that flew through a window and got caught in, a ho in the house. And the second, the woman living alone, that's a very odd story um, because there aren't any other people in that story. She loved her canary, and uh, I'll repeat what she said because I think it's so important and I, I like to um, keep this in mind. Perhaps it does not matter so much what it is one loves in this world, but love something one must. The third, third story about the hummingbird is really about the relationship between the woman, who's the bargain hunter, remember, and her practical husband, as she called him, and their common project of attracting humming, hummingbirds. And finally, the last story about a couple um, and how they managed living at first with the canary and then the husband who got so upset with it got rid of it. Uh, but they made a kind of a compromise uh, with, with the parakeet. So, as I said, I hope you enjoyed the reading, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>